So, we are going to start now with the third session of this morning. His name is Bruno González. He is the director of the analysis department of the Antifraud Office of Catalonia. He uh, holds a law degree, uh, but also he passed uh, two years of uh, engineering at the <laughs> Uni Polytechnic University of Barcelona. Um, he started practicing administrative law in a multidisciplinary international law firm. And at a later stage, he entered the public sector, where in the early years, he specialized in the field of public procurement. Uh, he held also some interim positions in different uh, town councils of Catalonia. And he passed uh, then the public examination to become a civil servant uh, of the local public, public sector with national qualification in 2008. So I give you the floor. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you for this presentation. So um, I'd like to, well, first of all, I have to uh, apologize in advance of the previous speaker for my English. I honestly think it's fully understandable, but if something of uh, the things I'm going to explain uh, sound strange or are not enough uh, clear, do not hesitate to interrupt me to ask any questions you want. And uh, this said, I'd like to uh, remember the main objective of this project as uh, exposed in the application filed before the European Commissions for the grant of the project. Uh, I quote, the objective of the project is to tackle corruption crimes in participating countries, focusing especially on private sector corruption. Most countries have developed skills in investigating public sector corruption cases and in gaining knowledge about public sector corruption. There is less information and skills related to private corruption. Uh, the initiatives uh, often lack cooperation and networking between private sectors, and the, cur the current project aims to overcome this lacunae. With this objective, uh, when I started uh, thinking on this presentation, uh, I, I thought um, it could be interesting to uh, spend a few minutes uh, on, a, on a general reflection about this concept of corruption in private sector. And then, uh, Presenting the, the structure of my speech, I will, first of all, uh, spend a little time on this general conceptual reflection. Uh, and then I will present you eight, I think, interesting cases we have uh, been dealing uh, with in uh, the, um, the anti-fraud office. And previously I will present very briefly, because it's a spoiler of the conference of my colleague Mark Cardona, uh, tomorrow about uh, the anti-fraud uh, mission and uh, the anti-fraud activity and uh, our proceedings uh, to allow you to understand better uh, what happened in the concrete case. So beginning with um, this uh, reflection, uh, the first thing I have to point out is that corruption is a, um, a polys polysemic term. Uh, here in Spain, we have a, a corruption perception problem, as I've previously said, uh, in the European Anti-Corruption Report of 2014. It's, uh, uh, it's shown how, uh, in Spain, um, people have a, um, a very deep sense uh, to live in a very corrupted country. Uh, but... Uh, the reality of corruption does not fit with this social perception. Uh, why mm, this phenomenon uh, exists? Uh, probably because the corruption concept and the corruption term have evolved uh, through years, through decades, uh, and starting um, in the 19th century liberal state, which main um, function and responsibility was just to preserve the public order, corruption in this um, historical and social context means um, mainly uh, the bribe payment to the police officer not to arrest the criminal. And this was more or less 
the only uh, concept of corruption. But with the rise and with the development of the welfare state, the public power became a major um, operator in the market, in the economy, and uh, a new, more complex, more diffuse forms of corruption arise and uh, also uh, different approaches to the study of corruption uh, took place uh, from an economical point of view, from a sociological point of view, the perception uh, of corruption point of view. So nowadays, uh, especially in the anti-fraud office, uh, we agree to work with uh, the definition, uh, which is uh, shown in this slide, uh, of the anti-corruption report definition. I quote, corruption in a broad sense as any use or abuse of power for private gain. We use a little modified uh, definition. Corruption as any use or abuse of public resources. And I see, and when I use the word resources, I mean not only financial resources, public funds, but also information. Because I know certain information, I am able to do certain things, usually bad things. Um, positional possibilities, because I am in a certain post, I am able to do favors to relatives, to um, friends. And uh, in Spain, uh, we have a proverb, favor con favor se paga, a favor is paid by a favor. Uh, and all this for a private benefit. This is the um, concept of corruption, um, which um, focuses mainly in the public sector. What about the corruption in private sector. There are, oops, I think there are two possible strategies, two possible approach of this idea, corruption in private sector, private corruption. The first strategy is uh, to strictly transpose the above mentioned definition in the uh, private sphere, in the private area. In this sense, corruption could be understood as any use or abuse of not public resources, but third-party resources for a personal benefit. An example will show this idea uh, more clearly. The managing board of a bank, of a financial entity, who use the resources of the entity, uh, funds from uh, clients, savers, from uh, investors, from shareholders, not to develop their business, financial business, but to appoint themselves seven figure salaries or other uh, golden parachutes. Uh, I, if I'm not wrong, I think uh, the public prosecutor's office is dealing with cases um, closely related to this kind of facts. And this is a, a concept of private corruption that is um, situated strictly in the private sphere. Even uh, in this sphere, certain um, crimes could be committed. But there's another strategy a more uh, difficult and complex uh, strategy, more difficult to handle, which focus on uh, triangular relationships uh, like uh, the one uh, are shown in the slide. In these triangular uh, relationships, there are a public party who usually uh, establish the rules, uh, rules that uh, um, act and that are project and focused uh, not only in the public sector, in the public area, but also in the market, for example, and the uh, public party which also acts in the market, in certain cases with um, privileges uh, inherent to the um, public condition of these entities, and in other cases as another economical actor of the market. Another of the parties of this triangular relationship is the private party, a corporation, a company, uh, who normally acts in the market without any privilege and which is submitted to the, to the rules of market, of, of um, any kind of rules, uh, who uh, interact with the public party in a very different ways, 
just an example, lobbying, lobbying uh, before the public party, before the legislature, or for the adoption of certain rules that um, are more beneficial uh, for the interests of the private party. And the third part of the relation is the stakeholders, shareholders of the companies, clients, consumers, citizenship. Uh, another example to illustrate this idea, the famous, it's in all the newspapers, dieselgate of Volkswagen Group. The, uh, a public party who established the environmental requirements that the uh, diesel engine must uh, accomplish. Uh, a private party, Volkswagen Group, uh, who um, trick this uh, with the famous uh, defeat, uh, defeat device in the E189 uh, engines of the cars. And uh, mm, everybody, all of us, uh, breathing the more contaminated uh, air that uh, cars provoke. So in, in this kind of uh, triangular relationships, uh, what is more interesting from my point of view is the red arrow, the relations between public party and private party. Why well, it's interesting? Because um, these kind of relationships and their complexity and their um, different forms uh, has um, reach an increasing importance uh, with the development of the welfare state uh, and uh, uh, pose a very interesting problems that I will uh, illustrate with the concrete case I will expose to you. Uh, that's another reason to um, focus my intervention in this uh, public and private interaction and it's um, because of my, uh, because of, um, I am uh, analysis director of the anti fraud office. And uh, uh, now it's the spoiler to your presentation, Mari, I apologize. Uh, I'd like to just to remember that the anti fraud office uh, deal with corruption in public sector. Not only uh, two of the main departments of the anti-fraud office, analysis department and the investigations department, deal with this kind of corruption in public sector. Uh, there's also the prevention department and uh, there's spe uh, specific uh, responsible for um, private sector corruption that uh, focus his uh, uh, activity on the private sector corruption, but uh, in our day-by-day -day work, we focus on these uh, interactions between uh, public and private sector. Uh, in this sense, the sphere of action of the anti fraud office, uh, specifically the sphere of action uh, which is concerned by uh, the in concrete investigations we perform, is uh, the public sector, the public sector of Catalonia, uh, that include uh, the government, the, local, the autonomous government of Catalonia and the autonomous administration of Catalonia, the local entities and also the public universities of Catalonia, and uh, uh, also private entities, but only uh, as far as these entities are public contractors or grant beneficiaries. And uh, uh, our activity, our investigative and analytic activity is limited only to the extent um, which the use uh, or allocation of public funds are concerned. So we deal with this kind of cases and uh, uh, which are our proceedings uh, and, and the case I'm going to expose to you uh, were um, handled uh, through this kind of proceeding. Uh, the office uh, start its activity on the basis, usually 90%, uh, on the basis of a complaint uh, presented by citizens, by uh, elected representatives, civil servants, uh, public employees, and in a it's approximative 10% of the cases uh, ex officio on the basis of information uh, gathered through um, different means. Uh, any uh, proceedings start with uh, what we call APV, it's the acronym, on, uh, acronym of Catalan Avaluació Previa de Versemblança, Previous Likelihood Plausibility Evaluation, which is performed by uh, the analysis department. And then uh, there are three possibilities. Uh, if mm, there is no reasons to start an investigation, as shown uh, on the right side, uh, we fill the profit, 
the proceedings and eventually in certain cases uh, we uh, emit a recommendations to the concerned entity if the facts uh, justify uh, so far the analysis could uh, establish certain elements certain items and the facts justify the starting of investigation then the file uh, is uh, referred to the investigation department which Theo Frank, which here runs, and in certain, say, residual uh, cases, when the facts uh, we are analyzing could be considered as criminal offenses, we directly refer the file and all the information we have to the public prosecutor's office, because by its legal configuration and by um, constitutional uh, principles, the anti fraud office, as an autonomous institution, could it investigate uh, criminal offenses. Uh, the results of the investigation, and I will very um, quickly sh skip this, uh, could uh, um, finish uh, by um, in, if the investigation uh, established that the facts probably could be considered as crimes, uh, the referral of the file, documents, and information to the public prosecutor's office. If the facts couldn't be considered as criminal offense, but um, implies an, uh, administrative offenses, uh, the office could propose uh, disciplinary sanctionings. Uh, we could not impose um, to the administrations to do certain things. We could make only a recommendation in this sense but uh, the news is that usually um, uh, it's what happened. And uh, uh, if the facts uh, we were investigating uh, are not punishable, are not administrative offenses, but um, shows uh, that are ethically questionable, uh, the office emit uh, a recommendation which is um, send it to the concerned public entity. And of course, if there's uh, any questionable elements at the end of the investigation, the uh, proceedings are filled. So um, this is the, the, the operational framework and the conceptual framework. And uh, in this framework, let me speak to you about eight interesting cases. Uh, I've put um, titles uh, to these uh, cases, and the first one, the title is Medical Dirigism, which was the case. The complainer was the owner of a shop of medical supplies, and the complaint uh, was uh, against certain physicians and surgeons of a public hospital of the same city. Uh, what were the facts? The facts were uh, these... Um, owner of the shop uh, received uh, a proposition of deal from these uh, physicians and surgeons. They will send patients to his shop and as a counterparty, uh, they ask him to pay a commission, uh, of course, uh, in an undeclared way, of about 30% of the turnover generated by these patients sent to uh, his shop. Uh, our complainers said no to this deal, and uh, what happened, obviously, the patients were sent to other uh, more collaborative um, shops. Uh, what is interesting is that the complainer had filled uh, his complaint not uh, only before the anti-fraud office, but also before the competition authorities, uh, ACO, the acronym of uh, Autoridad Catalana de la Competencia, and uh, uh, we decided to, uh, to um, paralyze our um, activity in the APV phase, uh, waiting for the decision of the competition authority. And uh, the decision of the competition authority were to uh, impose a fine, um, well, was quite a good fine, to the collaborative uh, shops uh, who uh, were um, supplying, the, who had the, almost the 80% of all the markets in the area. The competition authority's methodology is uh, quite different of our own methodology. Uh, they focus on the relevant market affected by these obviously anti-competitive um, proactives uh, and uh, uh, in an an official conversation with uh, members of the competition authorities, uh, they say us um, that they 
after a, a, a tough debate inside the competition authority, they reached the conclusion that they couldn't um, act against the public party of this deal. They could impose fines to the shops, to the market operators who were involved in this uh, anti-competition scheme, but they, couldn't, they have no power, no legally uh, empowerment to act against the um, physician and surgeons of the public hospital. Which is the lesson, the idea we can extract from this case, we can learn from this uh, concrete uh, File. Uh, the complementarity of the different approaches, of the different uh, law enforcement ways, uh, of the different uh, actors and institutions involved in these kind of situations. In these gray zones where there are these interactions between public and private parties, where there are these complex and difficult to handle interactions, uh, different actors could do different things. Of course, the Public Prosecutor's Office uh, have the, the, the exclusive possibility to uh, lead the accusation before a criminal court if there are um, criminal offenses. The anti-fraud office can act against the public party by uh, recommending the adoption of measures to avoid these kind of situations. Uh, and the competition authorities could act against the private party by um, imposing fines to the economical operators in this case. And I think this complementarity is uh, uh, an approach, a global approach. It's, it's an important part of a global approach in the fight against this kind of corruption, which had uh, elements in private and in public sector at the same time. Another case, the opposite case. Um, in this second case, collision public procurement, uh, started the ex officio when uh, the anti-fraud office uh, gathered information through a newspaper, uh, informa through a newspaper that a senior public official of the health care administration, Catalan health care administration, who was former uh, chief executive officer of a group of companies of the health care sector, um, had uh, certain um, powers of the company is still in force even he was not a um, member of the managing board of the company and he was in the uh, public administration. Uh, the news say that um, the strange thing, thing that smells really bad, was that uh, this group obtained uh, substantially better contracts uh, at this moment when his former CEO was in the public administration. And that was clearly a suspicion of um, inside information or other bad things. In the analysis um, evaluation in the APB phase, we asked <coughs> for a clarification of these facts to the company, and they um, provide us an uh, acceptable explanation. Uh, it was true that there were these powers, but they were not used by uh, the guy, by the uh, member of the health care administration. Uh, it was just a problem of uh, formalization, the, um, the cancellation the cancellation of these powers, uh, but they were not used. And uh, uh, the, the representative of the companies uh, provided us more detailed information about the public procurement process uh, that was um, denunciated as suspect by the news. They told us a very interesting thing. They, tell, uh, they told us uh, that uh, it was not true that uh, the company received a, a greater amount of the contract. What happened is that uh, in previous conversation between other companies of the sector, they reached an agreement to, um, uh, to uh, took part in the public procurement process uh, through a um, temporary union of companies. And the part which was uh, obtained inside this uh, temporary union of uh, companies by the company where the, the public official came from uh, was not greater but uh, smaller than the, the contracts uh, previously obtained by this company. 
uh, we decided then to uh, fill the, the proceeds. But this coming about, we were speaking with the other companies of the sector um, because we are in a crisis context and it's better for all of us not to fight uh, the ones against the others. Um, this comment uh, led us to refer the file to the competition authority. And a couple of weeks ago, another new uh, appeared in the newspaper, in the same newspaper, that the competition authority uh, had a, an investigation for anti-competition uh, um, anti um, offenses uh, against this company. So it's the opposite situation to the previous one. And again, we have an example of this complementarity of the different uh, actions of the different institutions. Another interesting case, uh, I've called it pre-contractual management and it's one of the uh, more important elements, more important parts of a public procurement process and more um, hidden or not so uh, well known. The concrete case, uh, it was a part of a bigger complaint uh, which uh, point to different things. But uh, one of the things uh, the complaint says was that uh, members of the managing board of the same group of companies of the healthcare sector have participated in meetings with high-level public managers for the design and conception of public procurement procedures in which um, the groups uh, later took part. Uh, in, again, in the APV um, analysis uh, phase, uh, we could uh, establish that uh, what really was happened is that uh, these members of the managing board of companies were at the same time representative of a sectoral business organization and that uh, they have participated in these meetings not as a, well, uh, not as, a, it's uh, perhaps not so clear, but um, mainly as a representative of this sectoral organization. Then we took into consideration that, uh, as said in an instruction of 2014 of the uh, evaluation and supervision of public procurement office of the administrative, uh, admin Catalan administration, the Generalitat, the participation of such a sectoral business organization in the pre contractual uh, management, pre contractual uh, conception of the future public procurement process uh, is considered as a good practice, but uh, always respecting transparency competition rules and non-discrimination. This mm, case, mm, even the, the final solution was to fill this part of the complaint. The other part was uh, very uh, worse and then uh, it was transferred to the investigation department. But even we have uh, filled this part of the complaint, the problem that uh, this case poses were to draw the red line between, uh, between which is uh, uh, fully legal and, and admissible, uh, pr um, in fact, analysis of the market previous to a public procurement process, and uh, what is, of course, uh, even could be a criminal offenses, which is the inside information, trafical influencias in the uh, Spanish uh, criminal definition. And uh, I'd like, uh, about these, um, mm -hmm. This, uh, this problem is clearly shown by the, another case. And this is not an anti-fraud office case, but a case, a real case in which I was personally involved when I was a sec secretary of a city council. Uh, and it's very interesting because it's at the same time, I think, I, I consider it, uh, it uh, a good practice and a not so good practice. What happened? Uh, in, the, in the town where I was uh, the secretary of the city council, uh, there were what is called in Spanish the blue zone. It's a public parking area normally marked with blue lines on the, on the streets uh, where you can park uh, paying a uh, well, it depends. In Barcelona, it's extremely expensive. Uh, you can park by paying in the park matters. 
the blue zone was exploited by a company, let's call it uh, a company, uh, in the framework of a concession. Uh, and the, the, um, the delay of the concession was, was near to finish. And at the same time, the city council have constructed a very big uh, parking, three floor parking under the marketplace. So uh, my major uh, told me, okay, we are going to uh, start the public procurement process to award the new concession that uh, include not only the blue zone, but also the market parking. What we have to do? Uh, my answer was, okay, we need an economical financial uh, analysis of this. Because one of the requirements of the major and of the uh, local government was uh, the flowing, uh, the construction of the parking was really expensive. I think it was about 10 million euros. So um, it was hard for the um, budget of the town to assume this uh, cost. Uh, and we want the new concession concessionary uh, to pay at the beginning of the concession. Um, one million, one and a half million euros. This is perfectly legal. Uh, but of course, the measure, as all the politicians want everything. We want a lot of money at the beginning of the concession. We want very um, popular prices of the blue zone and of the parking, and we want an extremely good management of all this. I told him, well, uh, everything is impossible, but with a, a beautiful excel of the different economical elements and uh, with a good analysis of uh, the, the economics of the concession, you uh, will have all the information to adopt the better decision, and it's a politi uh, political decision. The problem uh, was, uh, as it was pointed in the first uh, conference, uh, the lack of resources. Nobody in the administration, the local administration, was able to do this uh, economical analysis. There were an engineer, uh, who was a mobility engineer who told us, uh, well, I am not able, I am not economist, I can't do this uh, economical analysis. Uh, so how to, to, what we could do? What uh, uh, one of the manager, public manager of the city council has done was a good idea. He uh, called to the A company, the concessionary of the blue zone, and ask him, uh, okay, we are going to start uh, the public procurement process uh, for the awarding of the new concession that will include the parking. So please, could you send me an economical analysis of all these because it's your business, you know all the items, all the um, relevant elements, and that will be useful for us uh, to um, perform and to conceive the, the, the terms of reference and the, and the public procurement process. And then he called to the competition, uh, another company, let's call it B company, and he uh, asked uh, to this company the same thing. And when, we, uh, when he uh, had uh, the both economical studies, he make a mix, uh, he uh, elaborate a beautiful Excel uh, file with all the items on the basis of the economical information of companies of the sector, and on this basis the uh, requirements of the public procurement process were uh, established. Uh, the end of the story is well, I don't know if it's funny or very sad, but uh, what happened is that um, mm, well, I have suspicions that uh, the terms of reference were, or, or the main elements of the um, public procurement process were sent to both companies uh, to, in a way to guarantee their participation in the public procurement process. And uh, uh, the day before the plenary session of the city council uh, where the public procurement uh, process uh, was to be approved, uh, our um, public manager received uh, two phone calls. Uh, the A company's <coughs> representative uh, told him, uh, okay, it's wonderful, fantastic, but um, uh, because of our strategic uh, positioning in the market and our um, last strategic developments, we are not interested on your blue zone or on your parking. So, but um, good luck, and I'm sure that uh, the you will have a good uh, corporation, good company that will uh, became the new concessionary. And the big company said the same thing. Then uh, in, the, in the plenary session of the city council, this uh, file was um, 
calculated in table, but was not uh, approved, and um, uh, certain modifications were introduced in the terms of reference uh, to guarantee the participation of both companies in the public procur uh, procurement process. And that happened, and one of these companies uh, win the contract. Uh, why I consider this as a good practice? Because the facts shows uh, us that uh, the, the, our administration uh, reached the situation where all the economically relevant information was known by the administration. In short, we ask for the better we could ask. This is the reason why both companies uh, say us, no, we are not interested in this market. Mm, you are asking too much. You are on the limit. It was an economical uh, viable uh, conception, but without uh, enough uh, benefit margin for the companies. And uh, because we were in this situation, when we introduced the uh, other, um, modifications in the economical uh, items, uh, the, the city council was aware of which was the price to pay for this outsourcing of the management and the exploitation of the parking uh, facilities of the, of the city, uh, which is the, the, the worst part of this way of doing the things. Of course, the lack of transparency. What was done in an unofficial uh, way through telephonic contacts must be done in a f more formal ways and probably with more companies. Even uh, this specific sector is, uh, and this is notorious, uh, more or less um, oligopolistic sector. So um, if the different companies, it was also clear that the A and the B companies have uh, spoken between them and probably have said something like, these guys are really clever, um, they merit a lesson. And, and this is why, uh, what they have uh, done. Uh, another case, uh, well, as a, as a conclusion uh, of this case, as a lesson, as a reflection we can extract from this concrete case, uh, the K value, the, the um, strategic uh, value of information about the object of public procurement. Uh, the public party must know, must have the maximum information about they, uh, what they are uh, trying to obtain through public uh, procurement processes. And now a case which is just the opposite. Uh, I've called it public procurement as a black box. Uh, this, is, uh, this was a case of the uh, anti-fraud office, a uh, very interesting case because the complaint was a whistleblower, uh, an employee of a very uh, information and communication technology company. Uh, this guy uh, filled a, a, a complaint before the labor courts for moving and uh, a few weeks before he came to the office, uh, he, um, was, uh, he, he received a job offered in Australia. So um, he was nothing to lose here in Spain. He was near to um, go to Australia and he uh, visited us. And he uh, provided us a lot of emails of um, bad things and other uh, evidences of really bad things that happened inside this big uh, company. Um, one of these bad things what, uh, was this shim. Uh, a contracting authority uh, had to um, acquire uh, a software, or not exactly a, uh, to acquire software, but to develop and to uh, implement uh, customize the software X, it was a data protection software, and uh, the public procurement uh, process was um, uh, performed through which is called the, the negotiated process. Uh, in this process, the, the amount was not uh, so big, I think it was uh, about uh, 60,000 euros, uh, was not millions, it was uh, 
not so big amount. And uh, uh, this negotiated process uh, implies, because it's, uh, it's legal configuration, uh, to ask for three offers. But what happened? Uh, the three offers were uh, the three uh, shown in the figure. Uh, the winner offer was uh, the offer of company A, which was the big uh, company, big uh, ECT company, for, let's say, a price 95. The company B was the company who can save, the, who owned the software, the software X, and this company offer a price of 100. And a company C offer a price of 110, and we could uh, um, establish... Establish, establish, uh, we could establish. establish that there were a, a very close relationship between Company B and Company C because the managers of Company C were employees of the Company B. And our whistleblower provided us an email uh, between uh, the responsibles of uh, representative of Company B and Company A uh, that uh, said that um, inside the framework agreement between our companies, the price of the software for you, Company A, will be 50. So uh, we could prove that. Uh, one, probably there were collusion between these uh, three companies because of these conversations, between the, uh, these uh, relationships between <coughs> the third companies. And two, uh, at the end, there were uh, a prejudice for the contracting authorities because if the price of the software uh, fixed by the company owner of this software was 50, uh, the administration was paying, in the better case, 95. So um, it was overpaying um, a product that, if uh, directly acquired from the company B, would have uh, um, cost uh, less. Uh, it seems to us that it was clear that um, that could be a criminal offense, and we referred the file to the public prosecutor's office. But the public prosecutor's office filled the proceeding, uh, and uh, the reasons for this decision, uh, supposed in, in, the, in the decision, was the following. First of all, the connections, relations between A, B, and C could be explained in a legal way because of B is the owner of the software, so it's normal that there were conversations between the owner of the software who, um, who has the uh, intellectual property rights on this software and the other companies interested on develop and uh, implement this software. Uh, the public looking for the, for the uh, upper side of the scheme, the public procurement process was correctly resolved because the better offer, 95, was uh, selected and the contract was awarded to A, it's correct. And um, the, the decision of the public prosecutor's office uh, said uh, something like, the price fixed in the framework agreement between A and B, 50, is a poorly private price accorded in the market by two companies that have nothing to see with the public procurement process. Well, there are representatives of the public prosecutor's office, and I uh, don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, nobody, and especially not me, knows better than uh, the prosecutors the possibilities of a trial before a criminal court. And probably the decision uh, is, is a good decision because uh, uh, to spend time, resources, effort, uh, at least uh, public funds in defending or in leading an accusation in in a case that probably would uh, end in nothing uh, would be a bad, uh, a bad practice. What is really important is not what happened in this concrete case, but this idea of uh, the price between the two private company is a private price, nothing to see with the, um, the public procurement process. Uh, this is probably a, an idea which is very extended uh, before judges, before, and, and I know it extended uh, between uh, public managers or elected uh, representatives. Uh, the vision of the public procurement as a black box. I have the money, I have a problem, and as a major say uh, in front of me, I want somebody to come here to solve me this problem. Uh, 
And how to solve this problem? Uh, is this cost um, uh, too much or not? Is not my business. If I can pay it, I will pay it. This is um, important because it's a very extended uh, perception and it's um, quite obvious that it's not uh, uh, a good practice and it's not the better way to manage uh, the, um, the public efforts and especially the public funds, especially in uh, these times of uh, budgetary cuts and, and, and public uh, expanded to restrictions. Uh, in this sense, the most recent trends, uh, and this is a, um, a trend that is um, slowing but um, uh, uh, dipping, uh, being introduced as a good practice, uh, are pointed on uh, the ask uh, to more and more information about the object of the, uh, the contract. Uh, more and more in the public procurement process, um, a lot of information is asked to the bidders. Uh, part of this information could be declared by the bidder as confidential because of protected by industrial property rights, intellectual property rights, but the public administration, uh, while adopting uh, confidentiality measures, um, could know and could be aware of the inside um, functioning of the contract. And this is especially uh, a strategic element and a key element when uh, the contracts are very complex contracts and uh, usually complex contracts, complex operations uh, are very expensive uh, expenditures. Uh, again, with um, with this philosophy of uh, this bad um, practice, another case. Uh, well, uh, I used to not to say names, but it's quite obvious because it's <laughs> it's a case. But uh, what I'm going to say it's uh, you know, on the internet, so uh, there is not uh, confidentiality disclosure from <laughs> my own. Oh yes. Yes, this is. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, the water supply of Barcelona. Uh, the water supply in Barcelona uh, was provided by a company from, which was created in 1867, a uh, French company. Uh, and until 2012, uh, this um, public service was provided without any contract. Uh, Nobody was aware of this situation, but this was the fact. And in 2010, by other reasons, uh, a judge in a judicial decision um, exposed this situation, uh, qualifying it as a clearly irregular situation, and uh, that started a, a complex process to regularize these Irregular situation, and in 2012, uh, the regularization adopted the following uh, form: a joint company was created, uh, partially public owned, uh, in 50 percent by uh, the public administration of Barcelona, uh, Barcelona and uh, uh, and the suburbs, uh, suburban uh, different uh, towns, and in 85 percent by the uh, private corporation uh, who uh, provide the, the supply since the 19th century. Uh, this was performed through a, 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 an administrative process where there were no competitive uh, selection process. And it was um, uh, strongly argued uh, in, in the legal reports, in the, in the administrative uh, files. It was said that it was impossible to promote a, a competitive process because the private party owns all the infrastructure and it was impossible to conceive that another company uh, recreate all the uh, water supply infrastructure of uh, Barcelona, uh, big, um, one of the biggest cities in Spain uh, of these dimensions. So uh, with this idea, uh, the private company was selected as the uh, private uh, associate of this uh, joint company. Uh, we received a complaint from an ecologic um, uh, 
organization. Um, uh, and with uh, there were different things that were uh, denunciated, but uh, one of the claims was, uh, was uh, we um, had uh, indicia or partial evidences that the private company uh, has took a, a very important um, part in the conception and the financial and economical design of the operation and of course if it's a private company who performed these works, uh, they uh, did it in the better way for their own interest. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we decided to uh, file the proceedings uh, on the basis of uh, these considerations. First of all, even it could be discussed in a theoretical point of view, in a theoretical level, if uh, it could be possible or not to uh, perform a competitive selection process. Uh, it was mm, enough uh, strongly argued and justified in the administrative files. Uh, I personally consider that it mm, has been possible to uh, create a, a competitive, uh, pro to, to, to perform a competitive process um, by providing the possibilities of the new uh, concessionary to pay to the previous irregular concessionary uh, the amount of the investments done and non-amortized, amortized? Non-recuperated, uh, non-recovered by the exploitation of the, of the, of the business. Uh, and then um, to guarantee a real competition. But it was a very theoretical possibility, so we decided that it was enough justified in the file, in the administrative file, uh, this decision. And uh, uh, if it was impossible to promote competition for the selection of the uh, private uh, party of the joint company, uh, then, um, well, the orthodox way of doing the thing was, first of all, from the public party to uh, conserve the economy of the business, the new business, and then to negotiate with the private party if they agree and eventually they have to, to reach a, a deal. Uh, what happens seems to be the opposite. The public party said, okay, you know the business, you have all the information, uh, give us the information, and, well, uh, this information, this conception was uh, more or less critically assumed by the public party. Uh, we uh, send some recommendations um, in this sense, things that must be avoided, so far it could be possible uh, to the administration, but finally the, the, the case was closed uh, and uh, the lessons of this case, uh, from my point of view, personal opinion, is the, the highly uh, risk of uh, turnkey strategy. When a public entity asks for a turnkey solutions, uh, I have the money, I want a solution, I will pay the money, I don't want to know how the solution will be performed, mm, risk increases. Another interesting case, contradictory objectives. Uh, let's go back here, because the complainer was the same uh, of this case. One question could be, why the company B accept well, I have, uh, you have seen it, but I haven't pointed that uh, the company A, who uh, obtained the contract, uh, subcontract all the performing of the contract to the company B, who has the know-how, the technology. So the question, uh, the logical question could be why the company B accepted to play this game, to present an offer with a price of 100, if they offer to company A price of 500, they are losing benefits. If the benefit margin is 10%, 15%, the usual um, uh, industrial benefit uh, in, in their uh, relations, uh, in their deals with 
company A, why not to obtain um, 50 more by uh, offering the better price directly to the contracting authority? Uh, our whistleblower told us, okay, but company A is a really, really, really big company, and uh, a small company, uh, high-tech company like company B, um, uh, suffer the pressure of this kind of monster companies and the deal is uh, it's better for you to have us as uh, partners in this deal and in other deals uh, better than to ha um, have us as enemies in the market because we are bigger and we can break you completely or own you. Uh, and this situation is often fostered by uh, the public uh, entities, the, the con uh, contracting powers. And our whistleblower provides also a recording of a conversation he has with a senior manager of the big company. And the senior manager told him uh, uh, related to a very, 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 one of the bigger uh, public procurement process uh, of the last years here in Catalonia, which was, uh, we were speaking of uh, 800 million euros for the uh, acquisition, implementation, management, development, etc., of the new uh, information uh, communication technology model of the Catalan administration. And uh, related to this uh, process, the senior uh, manager told to our whistleblower, uh, the contracting authority want two things. They want uh, to, to foster, to guarantee that um, a very important part of the contract will be awarded uh, to uh, small and medium-sized um, local companies. But at the same time, they want to have a, a, a unique contact person. Then they are not able the administration is not able to manage relationships between 100 or 200 little companies uh, in a global uh, contract. So what uh, they want, they want uh, what was called it's a good uh, word, financial aggregator. And this financial aggregator, the unique interlocutor between the administration and the uh, contractor, it's us. And we will subcontract the little companies. Uh, and it's, well, it was just a conversation. Of course, it was not enough to do anything because it was just a conversation, uh, taking a coffee with somebody. But um, the, 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 it's plausible that this message was sent uh, at the height level. And uh, it's uh, plausible because there's another effect. Uh, the, the European legal framework of public procurement prohibits uh, the discrimination, uh, even the positive discrimination of local companies. Uh, we cannot uh, conceive a public procurement process to benefit Catalan, nor Spanish, nor French, nor German, nor local companies. All the companies, um, no discrimination must be uh, done between different companies in all the European uh, area. So uh, this was a way to uh, override this um, legal uh, prohibition because on the subcontracting level, it's easier to uh, heed this, um, in fact, this policy. And uh, the public procurement is, is viewed by the European Commission, by the European authorities, as a uh, major element of the economical policy of the countries. So mm, uh, this was, uh, it was plausible that this situation happens. We had no, uh, not enough elements to um, start an investigation nor to uh, send it to the public prosecutor's office. But um, it's an element to, to take into consideration uh, because there is this contradiction. We want local cooperation, but we want one big interlocutor. Uh, and uh, there's a risk, again, a risk. Uh, the bigger the partner, the less of the control of the contract. With a big, uh, th this turn K philosophy uh, appears with a lot of strongness in this kind of uh, strategies. 
And finally, uh, another case which is very interesting, but it's not closely related to the previous one, but uh, I think it's, it's, uh, the, the lessons we can learn from this case is, is really interesting. Um, it was a complaint about uh, the private funding of a public infrastructure here in Catalonia. Uh, the complainer uh, told us that uh, the money for the financiation of this structure uh, was in fact black money and that all this, uh, of this uh, contract was in fact uh, a money laundering scheme. Uh, we could uh, establish that in a first, in an early version of uh, the deal of the, of the operation, uh, the origin of the funds uh, was a fund based in the Cayman Islands and outed by um, people who came from Luke Oil. So there were reasonable suspicions that there were members of the Russian oligarchy, and that smelled uh, smell really bad. But uh, after a few months, uh, this fund was declaring bankruptcy by a Cayman Island course. That was incredible. And uh, uh, then the investors, the private investors, an international group with a lot of uh, shell uh, corporations in uh, Cayman Islands, in the um, British Virgin Islands, in a lot of uh, non-cooperative jurisdictions uh, present a new uh, funding uh, structure uh, with the presence of Sharia credits. As probably you know, uh, um, in, in Islam, uh, the loans are a sin. So uh, there are very specific kind of uh, contracts which are, if I'm not wrong, um, uh, um, selling with a, a rebuying uh, agreement that have the effect of a loan but that are uh, in conformity with the religious uh, precepts of the Sharia. And that seems a smell worse. So um, we, we established these facts and then we, uh, from the APV uh, phase of, the, of our proceeds, we send it uh, to the SEP Black, which is the Spanish FIU uh, in charge of money laundering investigations. And, uh, and we have no feedback because it's probably a, a work in, in progress. But what was really interesting, uh, th this case uh, had an, a certain echo and was released by the media. And uh, uh, there were some declaration of one of the elected representative of the administration uh, who uh, was asked by a journalist, uh, what about uh, these um, rumors of uh, money laundering in this, and uh, uh, his answer was, um, well, was curious. He said, I know personally Mr. X, the, the, the owner and the CEO of the private uh, company who was offering this funding. Uh, I guarantee his honorability, and uh, I will never ask for the origin of the money for a project that I consider good for my city that will uh, develop, uh, that will contribute to the economic development and to the attractivity of my city. Uh, so who cares where are the money from if they are well used in a public project? Uh, what is very interesting is uh, to uh, be aware that public administrations are not uh, bounded by uh, anti-money laundering obligations. Uh, a public administration is not subjected to uh, perform uh, suspicious, uh, suspicious transaction reporting to the uh, anti-money uh, anti laundering authorities uh, because it's presumed that a public administration um, has enough means and uh, is, has enough knowledge to um, be aware of the origin of the funds. That could be true or not, and especially in these times of budgetary cuts, of um, strong difficulties for, for the um, public powers uh, to obtain a financiation, capital markets. And then there's um, a, a risk area, a risk uh, zone uh, that is quite obvious. And, uh, uh, well, um, I 
last slide is a kind of conclusion just summarizing the, the key ideas. Uh, you can read it. Uh, this area, and, and well, uh, I will uh, skip quickly uh, just to remember it. The interest of public-private interaction as a risk area where a complex and diffuse new forms of corruption could be detected and obviously must be prevented. Uh, the interest of uh, multi-actor preventive and reactive uh, action, uh, different authorities with different powers acting on different areas uh, are strictly complementary. And uh, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a wrong strategy to, um, to concentrate all the powers on just one, um, uh, for example, uh, criminal pro law enforcement uh, institution. It's better to have different uh, actors and different possibilities to act in under different methodologies and with a different possibilities of actuation. Uh, the key important uh, of, uh, in the public procurement design and conception of information, uh, the, 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 as a good thing, the participation of private entities because uh, at least uh, companies uh, are the one who has the better knowledge of the market, of the technology to perform and to uh, reach the, the public objective. Uh, but um, uh, the problem uh, of drawing the red line between what is uh, a good market analysis previous to a public procurement process and what is um, or what could become inside information, manipulation, uh, bid reading, uh, manipulation of uh, public uh, procedure. Um, public procurement process, etc. Uh, the risk uh, inherent to turnkey strategies, uh, because it could imply the loss of control from the public party, and we have not to forget that the public party is the owner of the services, of the infrastructure, of, um, uh, so as an owner, uh, it has to have uh, the, the better control of this what is uh, his own uh, responsible. Uh, and uh, as a complementary aspect to the risk of money laundering in these uh, public private partnerships and in the private funding of public infrastructures. And uh, this is it. So I invite you to expose your point of view to participate. And if you have any questions, uh, that will be welcome. Uh, those recommendations which you are able to send to those uh, authorities, uh, are they obligated to make in real life? And have you also possibility to control them? Are they, make same, are they made some changes in their system? Um. No, they, they, uh, they, uh, they are not mandatory. We, we uh, meet recommendations, but uh, the concern and administration um, could not uh, observe them um, because we have no legal powers to impose uh, the adoption of our suggestions. But the fact is that uh, most of them, and here Theo could um, complete my answer, uh, the most of our recommendations are uh, assumed and are uh, fulfilled by the the administrations. Um. Yes, um, uh, allow me to jump in. I'm, I'm Teodoro Frank. I'm the director of investigations of uh, Anti-Fraud Office of Catalonia. And it is true that um, our recommendations are essentially that, recommendations, um, when there's uh, practices that are likely to be improved or there's certain lackings in the regulation of certain aspects by a certain administration, and despite the fact such recommendations are, are um, we don't expect a reply from the uh, administrative entity we address to. Um, um, there's been certain occasions in which, um, for instance, the government of the Generalitat has replied by the uh, competent departments uh, 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 providing us evidence that our recommendation had been um, uh, distributed amongst certain head of service and that they were 
um, encouraged to be uh, fulfilled. And there, there have been other cases in which we have, the administration has acknowledged receipt of such recommendations and therefore committed to, to apply them. Um, uh, but also, on the other hand, you must be aware that uh, the Anti-Fraud Office of Catalonia also um, uh, follows up the results of the investigation it has conducted, and therefore, uh, periodically after uh, time has passed, uh, we, we can uh, ask the administration we address recommendations or a report whether they had, uh, which measures they have implemented, whether they have uh, experienced any problems, or in, and if it's the case, which has been the result. Other questions, other reflections? Well, I guess we are all hungry. 